Leopold. Only people that watch Bugs Bunny would get that reference. This. this is a new honor song for Joy Harjo. <sighs> Just had a Red Bull. <laughs> okay. Just when you hear this track and the vocals, just think about something good in your life in this world and all the beauty too that Joy's brought all these years with her work. And um, just how we need art and to support art and to support each other. She's brought a lot of people with her to this appointment and that's so important. It's my first time singing to a track. <laughs>
please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Carla Hayden. Well, good evening and welcome to the Library of Congress. And first, I want to say how delighted I am to be back with all of you here in person. And to those of you who are watching the live stream throughout the country and the world, I hope that one day you'll be able to join us in the historic Coolidge Auditorium as well. I have to also start with thanking Jennifer Kreisberg. She just left <laughs> because that was such a powerful way to start this historic evening. I was standing backstage with Joy, and as Judith, or uh, Jennifer, kept going, because I'm a little plump, <laughs> as Jennifer kept going, we, we had to hold hands for a minute because music is unifying and universal. So please, another hand for Jennifer. <laughs> and before I talk about our 23rd Poet Laureate, consultant in poetry, I want to welcome another special guest to the stage, David Hill, Principal Chief of the Muscogee Greek Nation. You stay, you still go. And I will tell you, Jennifer's not lying. I saw her drinking that Red Bull. <laughs> and I cannot sing a high note like that, so I'm not singing tonight. <laughs> first of all, I'd like to comment first on what a special and honor and privilege it is to be here this evening to support Miss Joy Harjo. When I was first elected Principal Chief of Muscogee Creek Nation, it didn't really sink in on what a big deal it was until Joy contacted me and said she'd like to write a poem specifically for my inauguration. Only then did I know that I made it, especially when you get a call from her. <laughs> and simply put, Joy is one of the most celebrated and esteemed citizens in the history of our nation. We are proud of the extent of her accomplishment, her significant influence on the field of Native literary arts and music, and her advocacy for Native people and youth across the globe. Joy continuously demonstrates her commitment to our community and the advancement of our culture through participation in traditional and ceremonial events, and through creating opportunities for mentorship and arts education for our youth. Generations of Muscogee women will look up to her example and believe in her aspiration and their biggest dream can come true. And I'd like to embarrass all my Muscogee Creek women. I've seen several, so I'd like for them to all stand up, please. I always like to embarrass my wife. She's up here in the front. <clears throat> but I will say that Muscogee women, we are very proud of them. The backbone of every male. <clears throat> Her tenure as the U.S. Poet Laureate has exhibited the class, dignity, and strength that we've come to know her, that we come to know her for through her art and advocacy. Throughout her career and life, her work has honored our Muscogee language, culture, tradition, while connecting to the hearts and spirit of people around the world. Her writing, her music, and her legacy are heartfelt and genuine telling of the Muscogee condition and expresses the respect, humility, integrity, 
and responsibility that are all essential values to who we are as Muscogee people. Mado Joy. I know she's backstage, but Mano Joy, for all you have done. And may your future just as be as bright and accomplishment as your past. Thank you. Um, I also like to read a poem that she wrote. And to whom do I call my enemy? An enemy must be worthy of engagement. I turn in the direction of the sun and keep walking. It's the heart that asks the question, not my furious mind. The heart is the smallest cousin of the sun. It sees and knows everything. It hears the gnashing, even it, it hears the blessing. The door to the mind should only open from the heart. An enemy who gets in risks the danger of becoming a friend. And the title of that, this morning, I pray for an enemy. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Hill. Appreciate it. In September of 2019, I welcome Joy Harjo onto this stage as the library's 23rd Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry. And I'll never forget that moment and the performance she gave to a full capacity crowd, along with the three-piece band she shared stories and poems from throughout her half century long career and moved beautifully from reading to singing to playing her saxophone. If you weren't lucky enough to be there, I urge you to join the more than 75,000 viewers who watch the performance on the library's website, loc.gov, and on the YouTube page. So much has happened since that glorious, celebratory moment. In the months afterwards, Joy traveled tirelessly around the country giving readings, doing talks, and playing, performing until March of 2020. But our Poet Laureate quickly found ways to promote poetry as a connecting force in the time of fear and isolation. Just watch the video of Joy for the poetry of Home series launched by the library and the Washington Post in April of that year for National Poetry Month, and you'll see what I mean. Our laureate's second term brought the launch of her signature project, Living Nations, Living Words. The project features 47 contemporary native poets as part of an interactive story map and a new audio collection in the American Folklife Center as well as a companion anthology. The project grew out of Joy's multiple visits to the library's reading rooms, the first poet laureate to do that, where she met with historians, librarians, and specialists, and checked out the collections featuring Native peoples and cultures. And throughout 2020 and 21, Joy participated in other virtual programs for the library, including with the previous Poet Laureate, Rita Dove, and the other, Tracy K. Smith. And last fall, she returned to the Jefferson Building right here for a conversation with her old friend and former student, U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Dave Holland, who I'm thrilled to say is with us again tonight. Joyous sharing tonight's stage, you heard Miss Jennifer, and with the talented young poet, Portman Houghton Harjo, and with poetry ancestors she'll discuss and read work from. And to conclude and could coincide with her closing event, Joy also invited 
in Napo, indigenous nations poets, a national indigenous poetry community committed to mentoring emerging writers, nurturing the growth of indigenous poetic practices, and raising the visibility of all native writers past, present, and future. And over the last week, the library has had the privilege of hosting the fellows, the faculty, and their staff for the first ever retreat. And I'm delighted to say that the library's American Folk Life Center was able to co-sponsor this retreat as part of the Libraries of the People Widening the Path initiative. Supported by an institutional grant, the largest the libraries receive from the Mellon Foundation. And they are joining us here in Coolidge. So please stand up, fellows and faculty. Give them a hand. the best part of being a librarian. <laughs> but all of this only begins to capture what Joy has done to honor poets and poetry and to hold aloft Native voices during her three record terms as laureate. It's work she's always done and work I know she will continue to do and hopefully after some well-earned rest along that, alongside that work is the wealth of Joy's vital, timeless art, poems and writings and songs that help us continue on with beauty and honesty, reckoning and celebration. We were indeed, it says that I wrote down lucky, but I have to say we were blessed to have her as the 23rd Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, and I am so grateful to have her here with us now. Please join me in welcoming Joy Harjo. Don't go. I'm so happy to be here with you. It's been quite a journey here, these, these uh, three years that we've all been through and we're going through. But as uh, we learned, I think I've learned really how important poetry is during these times to hold the unspeakable. I'm going to start out with a song for the original keepers of these lands. Um, because our, you know, their songs, their, their thoughts, and how they cared for this land has everything to do with how these plant, beautiful plants are out here and the waters and so on. And um, so I wanted to say, Meadow, thank you to those keepers. Ultimately, we are all keepers of this place, and ultimately, we are all Earth, Ganujaga. And um, so this is a song to honor the original keepers. It's a beautiful place and um, thank you.
Yes, there is a little blues in there. <laughs> but yeah, my next project, I'm working on a story, a musical play that shows how Southeastern Native peoples, including our Muscogee people, are part of that origin story of blues and jazz. When I was a member of the National Council on the Arts during the years of 1998-2004, we attended a celebratory event that featured the country singer Faith Hill at the Library of Congress. Bill Ivey was our dedicated chair. I remember walking the first time up the wide, impressive steps to the largest library in the world. This ascending marked a kind of pilgrimage to an immense house of knowledge that holds over 170 million items with thousands arriving daily. I was in awe as I stepped inside the Jefferson Building into what appeared to be a temple of art and architecture. The building is a story of arts, funders, and philosophical and political notions. The first acquisition that my eyes lighted on was a copy of the Gutenberg Bible displayed in a lit case. This 15th century treasure was one of, the only, one of only three copies printed on vellum in the world. As we gathered to celebrate recordings and music, I glimpsed rooms of treasures, only a fragment of the collections and still nearly too much to take in. Nowhere in my mind lived any notion that one day I would have a place there as the U.S. Poet Laureate. Libraries were my refuge from the time I could read. Books were doorways, escape routes, or elaborate adventures to knowledge. My neighborhood library perched near one of the least impressive intersections in Northeast Tulsa, next to the TG&Y, a small five and dime variety store. The library was my weekly renewal station. Each week I would turn in the stack of books I'd read and check out more. I read everything and anything, and from medical textbooks to ponderous Dickens novels to biographies. Gaining knowledge was a constant in my life when everything else appeared to be moving in the direction of disaster. Feeding my mind and imagination kept me afloat and hopeful. There were no books by Native or American Indian poets, writers in that library, though the state of Oklahoma is home to the 39 Native nations and my dr district was in the Muscogee Creek Nation. The poets we studied in my elementary and secondary school classrooms led me to believe that mo poets in the world were old white men from New England or Europe. <laughs> then I found Emily Dickinson in the pages of Lewis Untermeyer's The Golden Treasury of Poetry. As I perched that large book between my skin knees, alone in my need to be alone, her voice reached out from the pages and made friends with me. I could hear her, though. We were years, miles, landscapes, and cultures away from each other. I read this poem aloud to myself in the near dark. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody, too? And then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. Emily's poems told me she too found herself with words. Poetry was a refuge from the instability and barrage of human disappointment, and fresh paths could be constructed with unique word and phrase constructions by writing a sideways music. I'm nobody who are you made it across boundaries of time, space, and culture to speak to a child holding poems as talismans, to keep away fear of the dark, to express awe in beauty or transform anxiety. When I went to Santa Fe, New Mexico to attend the Institute of American Indian Arts, a Bureau of Indian Affairs school then in 11th grade, poetry was as present as 2D, 3D, traditional, and the performing arts. Most of my classmates were within a generation of orality, that is, they came up knowing of the power of language as it expressed itself in native languages and ceremonial and traditional experience. Writing poetry was as natural as sketching in sketchbooks. There was a yearly anthology of poetry funded by the horror actor Vincent Price. I remember the poetry by Phil George and Emerson Blackhorse Mitchell. This is a poem by Nez Perce student Phil George, Battle One is Lost, 
We published it in When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, the Norton Anthology of Native Nations Poetry. All of the experts of that anthology were Native poets. This is an ancestor, yeah, that's great. <laughs> this is an ancestor poem, one of the first poems written by a Native that I ever read. Battle One is Lost by Phil George. They said, you are no longer a lad. I nodded. They said, enter the council lodge. I sat. They said, our lands are at stake. I scowled. They said, we are at war. I hated. They said, prepare red war symbols. I painted. They said, count coups. I scalped. They said, you'll see friends die. I cringed. They said, desperate warriors fight best. I charged. They said, some will be wounded. I bled. They said, to die is glorious. They lied. I began to write poetry as an undergraduate during the second semester of my first year of a studio fine arts degree at the University of New Mexico as I became involved with the Kiva Club, the native student organization. We saw our community as other students and the surrounding native communities and began to assist them in matters involving injustices including racial discrimination, especially in the border town of Gallup and in the many kinds of violence against native citizens. We also were witnesses at meetings around environmental impact involving coal and uranium companies. My children and I were often present when eloquent testimony was given by the native keepers of the lands in question. Energy companies and multinational corporations were stealing the lands and use of the lands by manipulation of laws and legislators. The community members giving testimony stood humbly and recounted their connection to the land and how they and their families and communities were part of these lands, these lands they were charged to caretake. Their speeches were ancestor poems. There was a dignity, attention to language and phrasing. Hearing them prompted me to want to write my own poetic constructions, to speak of injustice, to find a way to heal. During that time, I got permission I got special permission to study Navajo for my foreign language. Yeah, foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> Learning Navajo and writing poetry began together. I learned how culture lives in language, how each word can be an encyclopedia of knowledge. Navajo language emphasizes awareness of relationship and calls attention to how you move about in your transactions with everyone, all living beings. Larry Emerson, a Diné student leader in the Kiva Club who later became a writer, teacher, artist, and healer, said to Frank Morgan, a Navajo language specialist for Gloria Emerson's Navajo language organization, for which I worked as a photographer and illustrator, in the traditional way of Navajo thought, everything is related. I would come to understand that Muscogee language and thought are conceptually similar. I also began to look toward West Africa for poets who were close to orality and found Okot B. Patek, a Ugandan poet whose classic poetry collection, Song of Luino, became an ancestor book that I turned to for the bold truth-telling about acculturation. He com composed at first in his Akoli language, and it reminded me of what happened in the spaces between Navajo language or Muscogee and English. During my returns home from school, I found that most of our poetry was not written in books, but found in song making and other forms of orality like storytelling and speech making. To hear those forms, you had to return to the circle. Muscogee Creek poet Alexander Posey was one of the most nationally well-known and well-published poets from Oklahoma, from the borderlands of the late 19th and early 20th century. Posey was from Eufaula, where many of my relatives lived. My Aunt Lois Harjo said we were related through her grandmother, Millie, or Millie Carr, who married David Manawi. Posey lived during a time of great change in, at the Muscogee Creek as the, as the Muscogee Creek people transitioned through many shifts of fortune. The worst probably being the passing of the Dawes Act, a U.S. government act that instituted one of the largest land thefts by parceling tribal land for private ownership then giving away a vast majority of it to non-native people. Posey was directly involved as a translator for the Dawes agent. 
He founded the first daily news tribal newspaper in the nation, the Eufaula Indian Journal. He wrote about the dissolution of tribal governments and the dismantling of tribal lands. His fuss fixical letters were written from a fictional voice of local wit, wisdom, and dialect of a tribal citizen of our Creek Nation. Posey's poetry was more personal in voice and subject, even as he grappled with the same issues he confronted in his journalism. Reading Posey's poem assured, I imagine it is spirit food for young poets and artists trying to figure out the path of becoming a poet when there appears to be none. I imagine myself the ages of my grandchildren taking this poem to heart when the future doesn't feel so assured. In the poem, we all stand up in the flickering of life that can only happen with light and dark, pain and peace, wrong and right, and the worst and the best. Assured by Alexander Posey. Be it dark, be it bright, be it pain, be it rest. Be it wrong, be it right, it must be for the best. Some good must somewhere wait, and sometime joy and pain must cease to alternate, or else we live in vain. When home in the Muscogee Nation, I learned there are many houses of knowledge in this world. They do not occupy physical buildings, rather they are carried in memory. They are the unwritten songs and stories of indigenous peoples in this country and all over the world. There are vast storehouses of past and present works of literature and knowledge carried through time by the speakers and singers. Poems like the delight song of So I Tali by Inscott Mamaday turned me to the making of poetry. Like Mamaday, I came to poetry as an artist who painted and drew, and both Mamaday and I have a love of those traditional rituals that place the speaker-singer into an intimate relationship with a place on earth, a people. I believe every poem is a ritual. There is a naming, a beginning, a contradiction, or a question, leading possibly to revelation and enclosure, which can be an opening, set setting the reader, speaker, or singer out and back on a journey. I can hear the tribal speaker in his voice. He taught me that if I trust my voice to go where it needs to be to find home, it returns to where it belongs, back to the source of its longing. The Delight Song of Tsoi Tali by M. Scott Mamaday. I am a feather on the bright sky. I am the blue horse that runs in the plain. I am the fish that rolls shining in the water. I am the shadow that follows a child. I am the evening light, the luster of meadows. I am an eagle playing with the wind. I am a cluster of bright beads. I am the farthest star. I am the cold of dawn. I am the roaring of the rain. I am the glitter on the crest of the snow. I am the long track of the moon in a lake. I am a flame of four colors. I am a deer standing in the dusk. I am a field of sumac and the palm blanche. I am an angle of geese in the winter sky. I am the hunger of a young wolf. I am the whole dream of these things, you see. I am alive. I am alive. I stand in good relation to the earth. I stand in good relation to the gods. I stand in good relation to all that is beautiful. I stand in good relation to the daughter of Sintanti. You see, I am alive. I am alive. I was near the last year of my studies at UNM within 12 hours of a BFA in studio art when I changed my major to poetry. <laughs> I know some things just don't make sense, do they? <laughs> Despite the economic uncertainty of it, friends expressed concern. <laughs> Uh, friends expressed concern about my sanity. I didn't put that in there. <laughs> about my future, as I was a single mother with two and sometimes three children. Economically, it made no sense, and I was advised to take another major that would make a difference in our tribal communities. We needed lawyers, doctors, and educators. Poetry was seen as a hobby, something to do while you were engaged with a profession that mattered to the betterment of, to, of our communities. We needed warriors to fight in the legal system, and what use were poets when we needed basic services? I did not completely understand this path that had so compellingly arisen, but I was learning how important were to the creation of a society, and poetry was a most exacting use of language. 
I came to poetry to express what cannot be expressed in words. I saw that poems could be transformer stations of words to hold the grief, memories of massacres and wars, as well as places to hold love and appreciation of this complex and often beautiful story field. I had my own way to poetry. My allusions and cultural references were Creek, not Greek. <laughs> <laughs> We need poetry at transformational moments where we are irreparably changed. My laureateship has taught me this over, over anything else. Poets are also warriors of change. When I was a student working for social justice, I, declared, I decided that when I left this world, I wanted Native peoples to be seen as human beings. Poetry would be my way. To serve as the United States Poet Laureate has been a profound honor. I wanted my position as poet laureate to hold open the door for native poets, for poetry in this country, for those who love poetry, and those, for those who will come to understand how much they need poetry. My poet laureate project, Living Nations, Living Words, highlighted 47 contemporary native poets who placed themselves on the digital map to show that we are still here and our poetry is part of the American story and always has been. The project also featured an anthology and a teacher's toolkit, as well as recordings by the poets that formed a new collection in the American Folk Life Center. I also wanted it to be every native poet who ever lived. <laughs> we didn't have enough staff for that. <laughs> and then I wanted to show how everybody was connected and to show that um, because we have long associations with, you know, I came up with Sandra Cisneros, you know, and there's a poet, you know, we, we all know everybody, we're connected. As you have seen here in the audience, as you have seen here in the audience is a new generation of native poets, part of the inaugural retreat of Inipo, Indigenous Nations Poets, a new native organization committed to mentoring emerging writers, nurturing the growth of indigenous poetic practices and raising the visibility of all native writers past, present, and future. Yay. <laughs> That is just the best. You know, it's like these dreams we talked about when we were coming up, like Lucy and, and uh, a bunch of us talking about things like this happening one day. I would also like to recognize the other poet laureates here tonight as part of INAPO. Lucy Toss Pahanzo is the inaugural poet laureate of the Navajo Nation. You can stand. <laughs> Laura Tohi, the current Poet Laureate of the Navajo Nation. <laughs> Rena Priest, a Poet Laureate of Washington State. Kimber Kimberly Blazer, Poet Laure Wisconsin Poet Laureate, 2015 to 2016. And Denise Lowe, Kansas Poet Laureate, 2007-2009. Are there any others? That I have? Not yet. No, there will be. There will be. Many have taken care of me on this Poet Laureate journey. There is a literary initiatives office at the Library of Congress, including Rob Casper, Ann Holmes, and Anya Creighton. Yes. As well as the library's leader of the pack, Dr. Carla Hayden. <laughs> and all the many others whom I have worked with on staff who welcomed me and took care of me on this three-year journey, you have become part of my family. The Muscogee poet Jennifer Forrester has worked side by side with me and the Library of Congress team as the best assistant and inspiration along the way. And she couldn't be here tonight, but let's give her a, a hand. <laughs> On 
Anya Bachman, my booking agent, is my angel of travel. Jill Bialowski, my long-standing and patient editor from Norton, and her assistant, Drew Whiteman. Uh, Rosemary McCombs Maxey, who helped translate the Muskogee you'll hear later. Uh, all my Muskogee, actually. Um, Leslie Deer, who made this dress. <laughs> My sister, Margaret Barrels, who was with me, always checking books out at the library and reading. <laughs> Mado to my husband, Owen Sepulpa, my best friend, my amusing muse, and most enthusiastic supporter. <laughs> the support and uh, Jennifer, I want to thank um, yeah, Jennifer Kreisberg, who's joined me up here, who sang to open this event and will join me tonight with a song to end the evening. And, and the support of my Muskogee people means everything to me, including Chief David Hill, Second Chief Dale Beaver, and our people who have come to support me here. And now I would like to introduce one of our up and coming Muskogee poets, or I wish she'll be up in a minute. Now I would like to introduce one of our up and coming Muskogee poets, Portland. Out in Harjo. She is Muskogee Creek and Seminole. And no, not all of us Harjos are related. <laughs> <laughs> she has written a new poem for this occasion, and I will call her up after I read this poem of mine because it is a poetry ancestor to her poem. Perhaps the world ends here. The world begins at a kitchen table, no matter what. We must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, so it has been since creation and will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners, they scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it, we make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves and as we put ourselves, as we put ourselves back together once again at the kitchen table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. Now, please welcome Portland Houghton Harjo, one of our next generation of Muskogee. <laughs> Thank you, Mando, for having me. Um, it is such an honor to share the stage. I might get emotional because that was so beautiful, um, especially with Joy and Jennifer. Um, when I first met Joy, it was because of a poem that I wrote when I was 15. And without her, I might not have become a writer. I can tell that my mom is crying, <laughs> and that is why it's going to make me cry even more. <laughs> um, I think that I, in the world of poetry, owe her everything. And as I was writing this poem, I realized how much in conversation it was with Perhaps the World Ends Here, the poem that you just heard. Um, in this one, I also start at the best place to begin stories, the kitchen table. Haramchi Jathlis. This poem is a seance at my Nana's kitchen table. We are all around a kitchen table, yellowed by the bright sun. I am looking at my blood. My Aunt Doe at the window. My Uncle Junior next to her. Johnny May is next to me. I haven't seen you in a while, she says. I tell her that I see her each time I smell sandalwood in a clean kitchen. 
Engine hearts don't pump oil. We pump cedar and sage, running on dreams of uncles and hadam chihijathris, humming hymns of churches we haven't been to in years, humming our throats around words older than America. Gas station, catfish, grease, bloats, throats, keeping words in the front of mouths, tucked between split tongues, splintered esophagus, chattering and chuckling teeth. I breathe in and I smell everything. Smell the hand and soft skin of relations through time. I smell thick smoke tobacco, hidden cannabis, lie and hominy manipulated into soup or drink, pork in a crock pot, butter that sits waiting to be used. I smell memory and I take another breath to smell memory again and again. They call me baby and sister and hope to G, little girl, in a swivel chair at my Nana's nail salon. French tips square acrylic wipes at her red, red Revlon lipstick. Another breath and there was dirt in my nails, fire scent in my hair, sweat in my skin, a night in the summer, an alien cicada hum Oklahoma. I am surrounded by loved ones I've never met. Hadam chi jathlis. I will see you again. I can't stop talking to ghosts. I am haunted and wandering on the Milky Way, colliding with spirits and dreams, straining to listen, straining to learn. I am flung by memory, by a shelf, a collection of pasts, into the now. The backyard gravestones cradle my family's thoughts. We eat and celebrate in church basements that face east. We say, good morning, creator when the sun rises. We laugh loudly, always. A future can be found here. In the future, there will be no oil-rigged red earth. I will never need the Muscogee word for oil unless it's sizzling in a cast iron skillet. In the future, I laugh with ghosts. My teeth are bared in mid-air, crazy like Harjo, cackle with cracked joy. Memories will decompose freely and unworried, not forgetting but already knowing the past unmemoried and unburied. We will have all the knowledge that we need. We are alive in the future. We are unchoked. My gut will be cedar and sage green with a red heart and redder skin. The future will sound like our language, thick in my throat, vibrating hums, Cicada sui sui, unfurling tongue through teeth, a slither of reverberating waves no longer stuck. It will be a chorus of chihijathlis. I'll be seeing you. Hadam chihijathlis. I will see you again. Thank you. Hello again. Thank you, Portland. That was amazing. She wrote that poem for this, for this event. Thank you so much for coming and being here as part of this celebration. And uh, I guess we will close. No, there's, we're not closing because Rob gets to come up here and speak. <laughs> and um, this is a, it's a new song. And, uh, you know, I didn't start learning to play saxophone. No, I don't have my saxophone here. 
But I, uh, I learned to play on stage, which is not the best way to learn how to play anything. <laughs> All that to say, I'm learning to play uh, harmonica on stage tonight. <laughs> and uh, this was uh, Charlie Hill's harmonica. <laughs> The Oneida, the Oneida comedian who is so important to us. And this is the, the song, Remember. Remember the moon, know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn, that is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving tonight. Remember the earth whose skin you are, red, black, yellow, earth, white, brown. We are earth.
remember that you're all people and all people are you. Remember you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember that all is in motion, is growing as you. Remember the dan dance, that language is, that life is. Remember, 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 remember. Under the earth whose skin you are. Red, black, yellow, gray. White, brown, we are red. Remember, remember. Thank you all. A million thank yous could not be enough for one Joy Harjo. Uh, I'm Rob Casper, head of poaching literature here at the Library of Congress. <laughs> and I want to say how honored I am to be with you and to be with Joy tonight. Um, mostly, I'm happy to say that tonight is not our final goodbye to Joy as our poet laureate. Tomorrow night, at 7 o'clock, we will actually officially end her laureateship with a dance party, as per her wishes. <laughs> it's been years in coming, let me tell you. Um, and no, no dancing in the office, I think, will prepare us have prepared us for the experience of being outside with hopefully all of you on the steps of the Jefferson Building. So check out our website at lsc.gov. You'll hear more details. Also, I want to say to you, to those of you who are here uh, regularly, uh, DC residents and people who love coming back to the library, in May we will be kicking off our Live at the Library series. Each Thursday night, we'll have this building open late for you to come, have a drink, grab some food, check out our exhibits, and hopefully come experience something as life-changing as the event we've had tonight. So I hope you come back often. I hope you come tomorrow. I hope you check out the library and all of our resources. And really, again, please give a round of applause to our 23rd Poet Laureate, Joe Hargrove. <laughs>